Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's UC Ag Experts Talk. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide IPM Program. Cheryl Reynolds is also here with us to run the poll questions and troubleshoot any technical problems. And Dr. Carrie Arnold, who is an orchard and vineyard systems advisor with UCCE Stanislaus County is here to introduce our speakers and run the Q&A this afternoon. Please also note that this webinar is designed for growers and agricultural pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use in home environments. Okay, so with that, I think I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Carrie Arnold and she will introduce our speakers. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you very much for that opening, Stephanie. That was fantastic. and and well-structured. Uh, yes, I'm Carrie Arnold, um, and I do want to mention that this uh, great powdery mildew management and challenges um, extravaganza came together just from a farm call. So please call us. We are your farm advisors, your University of Cooperative, ex ex sorry, University of California Cooperative Extension Farm Advisors, and we are here to help you. So first up to talk about powdery mildew and the powdery mildew index is one of my great colleagues, Lynn Wunderlich, and she is a Cooperative Extension Farm Advisor in the Central Sierra. All right, Lynn, take it away. Let's get started and, and welcome everyone. Great to have you all join us this afternoon. Um, so let's start by talking about the, um, hold on a second. Uh, change how this, okay, great. Let's talk uh, by, um, let's start by talking about how powdery mildew reproduces. So the fungus has two spore types. The first are ascospores shown here on the left side of the screen. And these are produced in a um, hard like sac structure called casmothesia. The other are canidia. And these are asexual spores formed in this chain like structure on a short stalk uh, formed on infected tissue leaves and berries. Um, the two spore types are important to note because they have different environmental conditions for occurring. And the chasmothesia and the ascospores play a brief but critical role in the powdery mildew life cycle. And that is, is that they're responsible for initial spring infection. So the chasmothesia over winter, the ascospores, and in the spring when environmental conditions are right, these, these are the spores that cause the first in, infection. So when we think about this, next season's powdery mildew is beginning right now, right this year, when the chasmothesia form in infected berries, leaves, and shoots. And you'll see here, I've included on these slides, the disease triangle. And these are the three components that we need to have present for disease to occur. We need the pathogen, obviously, the host, and the environment. So here we see the chasmothesia forming, you know, if you, if you have um, infection, infected areas in your vineyard now, and hopefully you don't have anything that looks this bad, but certainly, um, you know, if you do have hot spots or uh, problem areas in the vineyard, this would be the, the place, and you probably could, can start to find chasmothesia forming now. And these, these chasmothesia are washed with winter rains into the trunk and cracks and crevices of the bark and the cordon where they are sit protected over the winter. And in spring, when we have conditions are right, so this is the environment part of the disease triangle, these ascospores will germinate. What conditions are necessary? Well, we need a little bit of, of moisture for ascospores to germinate. Not much, it can be in the form of rain, dew, fog, heavy fog, even overhead sprinkling for it can provide about 0.4 inches of moisture to cause ascospores to germinate. That moisture combined with optimal temperatures of 50 to 81 degrees Fahrenheit will cause these spores to germinate. But we need one more thing here for disease to occur, right? And that's the host. So um, dormant tissue is not susceptible to powdery mildew only when we have bud break occur. And as soon as bud break occurs, so as soon as we have the emergence of green tissue, do we have uh, the, the host tissue present 
uh, for infection to occur. And this is, this is, we call this primary or initial infection. Now there's another way for powdery mildew to overwinter and that's termed bud perination. And that's basically when the buds are already infected when they go into overwintering. So when they emerge in spring, they come out infected with powdery mildew mycelium. Um, I, it's, it's rare in my area to see this occur. Uh, and it, it seems to occur in, in regions where we have cool springs. So the whole rest of the season, we're looking at conidial infections, driving the powdery mildew cycle. And that's, again, dependent on optimal environmental conditions. And the key here is canopy temperatures. Canopy temperatures between 70 and 86 degrees are perfect for powdery mildew. So I like to say that when we're comfortable, powdery mildew is comfortable also, and, and it's in the canopy growing. And you have to uh, also note that this, these are canopy temperatures, not ambient temperatures that we're talking about. We don't need rain or moisture for conidial infections to occur. Um, you, you do need some relative humidity, but relative humidity plays a much smaller role in environmental conditions for conidial infection than these optimal temperatures of 70 to 86 degrees. Okay, so here you can imagine you know, a landscape. This is obviously a foothill landscape with a number of vineyard blocks um, uh, just after bud break in, in, the, in the beginning of the season. And these blocks could be all managed by the same grower and maybe be different varieties. Maybe we've got a more susceptible Chardonnay variety over here compared to a less susceptible variety over here, or they could be managed by different people. And, uh, and then let's just say that this, this susceptible Chardonnay over here, this is the hot spot. So this is where powdery mildew has overwintered in these Chasmothecia. The conditions in spring were right for ascospores to germinate. And those ascospores germinated, and when green tissue was available, they infected that tissue. And if there was no protective treatment applied, that, uh, the, that um, infection proliferated through the tissue and started to produce these conidia. Now, everybody else is clean, but this, this is a hot spot, okay? So this is a situation where it requires early treatment, right? And then later, once these conidia have uh, germinated and are available, they're going to become windborne. And that's the source of infection for everybody else in the neighborhood, okay? So you, you have to have your green tissue protected with fungicide, good coverage, essential, before the conidia arrive. Once they arrive, they're gonna land, they're going to infect any tissue, assuming that the environmental conditions are, uh, are Right, and that cycle will continue until about verasion. So berries are no longer susceptible at 8% sugar, um, but spores are still produced until 15% sugar. And of course, the, the challenge is, is that not all the berries change um, and go into verasion at once. So we have some susceptible berries here along with some, um, some that are no longer susceptible, but you need to continue protecting this fruit. So um, it's the, the, one of the main challenges, I think, with uh, controlling powdery mildew is how critical it is to do early treatment and how difficult it is to see the fungus when it's first growing. Um, these are some slides that I took from an untreated uh, block of a, a mildew trial I did years ago. And here's a lesion of powdery mildew right here at the tip of my thumb. Here, it's a, it's a light yellowish, roundish colony. And on the underside, you can barely see the gray conidia there. And again, here at the tip of my thumb here, here's an, here's an infection. And, and you know we typically have bud break here about the 1st of April. And this infection showed up where I could see it in this vineyard block that I believe started clean by the uh, first week of May that season. Uh, soon after that, um, the canidia continued to, to reproduce in this untreated block. So by, uh, by a month later, you know, it was very much more obvious to see on the young berries. Here's those canidia. And you, if you kind of look on the, on the 
uh, horizon of the berry, you can see the uh, canidia sticking up there. And then, you know, a few weeks later, since we had optimal conditions for mildew to thrive and canidia to reproduce, this is what we see. Um, so how do we know mildew is present? Well, we, we look for it, but I've just told you how difficult it is to see and that this requires training and is time consuming. I mean, spent hours out in this uh, vineyard trial block looking for mildew um, and that's expensive. So it's not really practical. Now we do have spore trapping as an option. And I think I keeps gonna mention that a little later this afternoon. Um, and that's a great tool that we can, we can use to know if mildew is present. But for most of us, we are risk averse, especially with mildew, um, because we know it's only a small amount can cause off flavors in wine. So we assume it is there, right? And, and we use the powdery mildew risk index model uh, to determine conidial infection risk. Okay, so this is very much driven, again, the key here are canopy temperatures, 70 to 86 degrees, for canidia to grow and thrive. And so to monitor for these temperatures, we place our temperature sensor. This is inside the solar shield here in the canopy. It's very important that they be in the canopy. And these, uh, these sensors are connected and you, you might have a rain gauge or other sensors connected to a data logger and a telepathy system to um, a wireless communication system to uh, transmit the data to a network, a, a provider, a server that would um, put that in a grower friendly format on the internet for you to see. So we begin the model after three consecutive days with six or more continuous hours between 70 and 86 degrees. Six continuous hours, it can be nighttime, between 70 and 86 degrees, three days like that. And we start our model and we start accumulating points. So the scale for this model, and it's a canidial model, right? For canidial production is from one to a hundred and points are accumulated like this. If we see six or more continuous hours between 70 and 86 degrees, we add 20 points. If we have less than six, we subtract 10 points. If we have hot temperatures, 95 degrees or higher for 15 minutes or more, we subtract points. So um, this is uh, one way that, and this is, this is real data that I just looked up from one of our stations. And this is how the, one of the formats that UCIPM pre presents the data in, in table form. And I, I love the way this is presented because here we have the column here showing the hours between 70 and 85 degrees. And we're looking for the magic number six here. And then we also have the column here of hours greater than 95 degrees. So for example, on, the, on August 4th at this station, uh, we went into the index the day, the day before with 60 points, high disease pressure. But that day, we had more than six hours accumulated between 70 and 85 degrees. Uh, so typically we would add 20 more points, except that it got hot. So we subtract 10 points for a net accumulation of 10 points. So we go from 60 to 70 points. The next day, we, are, we don't accumulate enough hours in the sweet spot. So we minus 10 points. We subtract another 10 points the following day. And then the next day, we hit six hours, the magic number between 70 and 85 degrees, and we add 20 points to the index. So we're back from moderate to high and, and looking at um, continuing, like as you see here. So, um, so I recommend um, using the model in conjunction with the minimum interval for the material that you, uh, that you spray. So the minimal spray interval, so the least amount of persistence. So a lot of materials will have uh, a range of persistence. They'll last between 14 and 21 days, for example, or say sulfur will last maybe five to 10 days. So if you do an application of, of a material, 
you look at the minimum interval. And on that date, you look at the weather report and at the index and you try and forecast what your index is going to do. So is it going to get hot out? Well, if it's going to get, if temperatures are going to be hot, then we can, uh, we can suggest that the, um, the index will decrease and we can maybe wait a little bit longer before we need to spray. If we have mild temperatures in the forecast, then we know the index is going to be high, disease pressure is going to be high. And depending on the material, we'll want to, we might want to make a spray decision. And this is the classic table that, that looks at those spray inter intervals. So here's the index and it's grouped into these three categories. And there's no difference um, between points. Um, so what I mean by that is once you're at 60 points, you're at high pressure. It doesn't, there's not a difference between 60, 80, and 100 points, um, except in how, how the model is going to be forecast into the future. So um, from zero to 30, when the in points, the disease pressure is considered low, the powdery mildew pathogen is present, but not reproducing. When there's 30 to 50 points, disease pressure is intermediate the pathogen reproduces about every 15 days. And when pressure is high, the index is 60 or higher, it rep reproduces every five days. And so we have a suggested spray schedule based on the material category and the index. Okay, so generally there's three ways the powdery mildew risk index um, can help save a spray. And this is, and when I say this, I mean in clean blocks only. The first is the first spray of the season delayed. The second is spray intervals lengthened. And the third is high temperatures drop the PMI. Thank you very much, Lynn. That was a great um, introduction to our topic today. Larry Bettega, he is hailing from Monterey, San Benito and Santa Cruz counties. And he is a farm advisor there. He's going to talk to us about uh, the integrated powdery mildew control program and the value of sulfur. Anyway, I'm going to talk today about the, the value of sulfur in, uh, in the powdery mildew control program. And again, uh, it always has been an uh, important part of uh, controlling powdery mildew in, in grapes. And again, the sulfur has been known to have certain pesticidal properties for a long time. Uh, the ancient Greeks uh, used it and, and burned sulfur for... Um, the purpose of uh, sterilizing uh, different uh, homes and other potential uses. But when it comes to plant pathology, it was first uh, recorded to be used as a uh, disease control on uh, controlling mildew on tree crops. And that was uh, in 1803. But when it comes to viticulture, the importance is when uh, the Europeans brought um, uh, the American powdery mildew into Europe, uh, it was first observed in a greenhouse in England in, in 1845. And, and it was also discovered uh, that by painting sulfur on, on the heating pipes of those greenhouses, they can control powdery mildew. But then by uh, the 1847, uh, the first uh, report of mildew in, in France was, was seen in a vineyard near Paris. And again, uh, unfortunately, uh, that powdery mildew uh, moved very rapidly through Europe. And so by the 1850s, uh, it was very common. It was causing widespread uh, problems. But again, uh, in, in the 1850s, it was also noted that they could use uh, the dusting of, of sulfur to control that powdery mildew. Oops, wrong way. And so again, this slide here just shows the impact of, uh, of, a, of a disease into a very susceptible crop being vinifera grapes. And so here you see uh, in the wine production in France from uh, 1847 prior to mildew becoming a problem. And then in the thick of uh, the mildew problems in Europe, uh, or especially in France here, you see a, a drastic drop in wine production. But then again, with the adoption of, uh, of powdery mildew as a, as a control uh, material, you see that production come back. And so again, we've used sulfur now in wine grapes for over 170 years, very successfully control of powdery mildew on vinifera grapes. 
Again, if you look at California, this is a chart uh, showing you the uh, acres treated with different pesticides. And so you can see that uh, for wine grapes in California, that sulfur has, has applied to more acres than any other uh, group. And again, it's interesting to note that if you combine uh, the, the, the sulfur here in yellow and, and fungicides in general, I would say that a lot of those fungicides uh, are going on for powdery mildew control. And so we see that the use of fungicides in grapes, uh, especially in California, outweigh the uh, use of uh, insecticides and herbicides on a treated acre basis. Again, if you look at uh, what is applied, these are uh, the, the, the most recent figures are for 218. Again, the, these active ingredients uh, that are listed here are primarily used for, for, uh, for powdery mildew control. And again, you see the acres are, 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 are uh, treated acres are 2.7 million acres in California, uh, or California wine grapes. And then you see, of course, uh, 23 uh, million pounds. And so again, sulfur is applied at a much higher rate than especially some of the synthetic materials. But again, as you can see, that sulfur still is a very important component of uh, control programs for powdery mildew uh, in the world. Again, the benefits of sulfur, again, we've used it for 170 years. We have good efficacy for, for mildew control when it's used correctly. Again, it has very low potential for disease development. And again, because of that, it becomes a very effective resistance management product, especially as we see some in some vineyards, uh, you know, the, the, the resistance developing to some of the synthetic materials. Again, most of our uh, more recent synthetic materials have a high potential for, for, uh, for resistance uh, if they're used improperly. And again, we, we know that we have to use some kind of resistance management to hopefully prolong the use of those. And again, a sulfur is, can become a very effective uh, material in that resistance management uh, work. Again, sulfur compared to some of the other fungicides is, is very low cost. And again, it is acceptable for use in organic and biological protection systems. And again, especially for, for certain, some of these systems, it really is the backbone for, for a, a mildew control program. And then we also see uh, some suppression of other uh, pest populations, probably most, most notably is the suppression of area phyads. And it's kind of a curiosity many years ago when people were eliminating sulfur from a program, we did, we do, you can see sometimes resurgence of these area phyad mites causing problems or in, in graves. But with a, with a few applications, typically those things are, are, are suppressed. Again, uh, there's also some negatives to sulfur use. And again, the most notably has been the potential for uh, sulfide production in, 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 during fermentation. And again, we know that when, when uh, those sulfur le levels at harvest, uh, are above 10 uh, milligrams per liter, uh, there is the potential for, for uh, sulfide production. Again, uh, if we eliminate sulfur out of the, out of the uh, kind of treatment schedule, and that happens uh, at, at a minimum of uh, maybe five weeks prior to harvest, typically those levels will be below that, that 10 uh, milligrams per liter. And again, it's more problematic on reds because uh, you're fermenting uh, the skins as opposed to whites, whereas oftentimes uh, those levels of uh, maybe uh, the sulfur residues are, are dropped out during the settling of that, that, uh, that must. Again, the other negative thing has been is uh, the use of uh, with dust uh, formulations is drift offsite. And again, some areas that's been a, a big issue uh, with, with sulfur applications. Again, sulfur is detrimental to some of the natural enemies, uh, most notably probably the uh, suppression of some of the predator mite species uh, is probably the one that's probably most noted that uh, with the elimination or reduction of sulfur, uh, sometimes you see greater activity with some of the, uh, the, 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 the mite predators. 
And again, there's a, there's is potential for plant tissue burn with the use of sulfur. Again, at higher temperatures, and especially higher temperatures in combination with high humidity, uh, we can see leaf burn uh, with the use of sulfur. Now, some of that can be reduced by reducing the rate, uh, and also then by uh, timing those applications to avoid uh, the higher temperatures that would uh, cause some of that burn. Again, sulfur formulations come in several forms. Uh, traditionally, you use dust uh, formulations. Uh, and then there are uh, wettable powder formulations that allow that uh, sulfur to, to stay in suspension. Uh, probably better yet are some of the micronized dry flowables that uh, actually go in, in, in suspension quite nicely and then have the added benefit of being micronized. Uh, and so have a more uniform particle size. There's also liquid flowable uh, sulfur formulations. And then again, there's also lime sulfur, which is, uh, is a combination of, uh, of lime and sulfur. And again, especially after that spray has been put on, if there is any residue, it, it's really sulfur that, uh, uh, from that lime sulfur application that gives you any residual control of powdery mildew. Again, sulfur particle size is very uh, critical to uh, efficacy and also adherence. And so again, finer particles are going to, going to adhere much more readily. And also the, the, the rate of how those uh, volatilize uh, has a great impact on, um, on activity. And so again, the dust formulations generally have the, the largest particle size. Uh, standard kind of wettable powder, there's, as you see there, there's more of a range and it has an average larger particle size compared to the dry flowables, which that range of size is much more narrow. And again, that average micron of that particle size is around three. And so again, that's also why sometimes you see better activity with some of these micronized uh, uh, sulfurs versus, uh, you know, the traditional just, uh, you know, standard uh, uh, sulfur uh, formulations. Again, sulfur mode of action, it, it's believed that it, it inhibits uh, um, the process uh, within the uh, mitochondria of the Krebs cycle. And so because of that, uh, it most likely is uh, as a multi-site action. And that's also the reason why uh, we, we don't see resistance uh, being developed to this type of product, even, we've, even though we've used it for over 170 years. Again, sulfur can do uh, several things. Uh, it can kill spores already present, but not yet causing infection. And so in that way, it acts as an eradicant. It can kill spores which arrive subsequent to that sulfur being coated to the surface. So that way it's, uh, it, it is a protectant. And it also can kill us established colonies. And, and, but this has been looked at and it's really it, it's when that spore lands and starts the infection but before you can see it if, if you actually get the sulfur uh, application on soon enough it can actually eradicate those very early infections uh, the problem is when you have very well established infections then it becomes very hard for sulfur to have any uh, eradication type activity it's just going to have suppressant then at that point of, 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 of the spores that might be developing And again, the, the, the efficacy is greatly influenced by what phase that sulfur's in. And so there's two phases. There's a contact phase. And so that's not influenced by temperature. And then there's the vapor phase, which is probably the greater activity sometimes that we depend on, and that's temperature dependent. So as you get colder temperatures, that, that, that sulfur is not gonna vaporize as, more, as efficiently as it would under higher temperatures. Again, that's also the reason why you see sulfur burn at very high temperatures. And so as you get above 90 degrees, that, that vaporization is gonna be uh, very high. And again, that's also, it can be high enough where you can get then potential uh, leaf burn at, at very high temperatures. But the studies have shown that the contact activity uh, that, that is not influenced by temperature, but then at, at lower temperatures, if you're depending on that contact, uh, uh, 
um, action to control mildew, it, it, it is a rate dependent. And so at higher rates, when you have cold conditions, you should be applying that sulfur at much higher rates than when you have warmer conditions. And so typically, if you're using wettable sulfur, uh, it should probably be around a five pound per acre rate, as opposed to maybe under warmer conditions, you get equivalent control at a much lower rate. Again, uh, the cost of sulfur is, is again, significantly less because the material is cheaper. And then especially if you're doing a dust application, the uh, application cost of that is, is much lower as opposed to a, a, a spray that's been using water as a, as a carrier. And so you see here, uh, uh, sulfur dust, very inexpensive, uh, a little cheaper uh, application rate compared to the sprays. And so that, is a factor, um, especially as uh, margins are thin. Uh, you know, many parts of California, sulfur really is what we're relying on to control powdery mildew, which that may or may not be then supplemented with synthetic uh, uh, fungicides at certain key development periods, especially during the bloom and early fruit set period when those berries are most susceptible to infection. I want to end with just showing you a couple slides here. And again, uh, these are some, uh, I'm going to show you two years. Again, these are both in uh, vineyards in the Central Coast, Chardonnay under uh, really high pressure situations. But here you see sulfur um, providing good disease control. Um, but again, um, having a little bit more disease in some of the synthetic materials. Uh, it's interesting to note here that Here's a, 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 a rotation of Rhyme, Luna Experience, Quintec, Rhyme, Vivendo, Quintec. So six applications and a very good disease control. But then again, if you incorporate uh, these with sulfur, you see uh, a little bit greater activity. And so again, that's what we say sometimes uh, the benefit of, 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 of some of these materials that might be uh, developing a little bit of uh, resistance or maybe seeing less activity. If you incorporate sulfur as a tank mix, we can suppress then the development of those resistant isolates within that vineyard. And I'm just gonna show you one more. This is uh, this past season. This is a test we just uh, completed. And uh, again, a little higher pressure this year uh, as opposed to the previous year. Uh, so we see sulfur here with a little bit more disease. Uh, I've worked in this vineyard for many years and we know that uh, these, this sulfur was a wettable sulfur, five pounds per acre applied on a 14 day interval. Uh, under high pressure situations, that interval probably should have been tighter. So probably a seven to 10 days. And the past where we have done that, then we actually get, we can improve uh, or reduce this disease level to a, to a much lower and probably better accepted level. But again, that what I wanna show you is uh, here again is a, a rotation of, uh, of several materials, uh, still having okay disease control, but you see the incidence is a little higher. With the incorporation of sulfur into that spray program, you see a significant reduction in incidence and a little lower uh, disease severity rating. And so again, that's the benefit of incorporating sulfur into, into some of these programs. Great presentation, a great question. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Lynn again. She's going to present now for us a sprayer setting influences on powdery mildew control. Okay, great. Thank you, Carrie. I am back here. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy that we have some time today, just a little bit of time, but it's better than nothing to talk about sprayer settings and how they do influence our disease control. Um, because we know now that not only for good control that we need to choose the right material, we need to choose the right timing to apply the material, but the operator also has to have the knowledge and skill to adjust the sp sprayer settings to get that coverage that we so desperately need, right? So, oh. okay, so what affects coverage? 
Well, many things do, some of those in our control and some of those not. So um, the density of the canopy, and this of course with grapes changes greatly from bud break to harvest, the seasonality of the canopy. And it changes also with canopy management. Maybe the best sprayer setting could be a leafing machine or you know, um, some shoot removal that done at, at, to, to open up the canopy. Um, the density of, of the canopy can also uh, differ with different varieties. And of course, with different site conditions, um, the vigor of the site. Um, so you could see differences in different blocks where, where you might need to consider changing your sprayer settings. Um, the sprayer uh, settings themselves affect coverage greatly primarily travel speed, and I'm going to focus on travel speed and a little bit on air today, um, and also nozzle selection, droplet size spectra, and flow rate that are influenced by your nozzle selection, and of course, nozzle orientation to the canopy, and weather conditions can affect whether you get good coverage, and um, Mark is going to address those that topic in a few moments here. So, um, so, Measuring travel speed is part of calibration and calibration is fundamental to good coverage. So here we are, um, we're measuring our travel speed. It's always recommended that we do that in the, in the environment that we're spraying in, in the actual vineyard. That's gonna affect our speed with our tank at least half full and to measure it for at least a hundred feet. Um, but even with an accurate measurement, your coverage could still be Poor. And here's my friend Matt thinking, gee, I wish there were some canopy here so we could really determine proper speed. Because canopy is an important part of determining speed. And unfortunately, a lot of times our calibrations are done only at the beginning of the season or during the dormant season when we have no canopy. And because of that, we're really missing an opportunity to optimize our sprayers and our spray coverage. So setting and measuring proper speed should be done in conjunction with canopy growth. Because obviously looking at these two photos, the speed's gonna be different depending on the canopy, right? But there's one other factor we need to, con to consider for setting proper speed, and that's the sprayer fan. Okay, so proper ground speed is really the interaction of the consideration of the speed, the canopy, and the sprayer fan. Those three things determine proper ground speed. Now, what's the job of the fan? And those of you who've seen me speak before in teaching, uh, calibration doing my trainings, I like to ask, is it your friend or is it your foe? Because in reality, it's probably both. The fan's necessary for us to, um, to be able to transport those droplets into to canopies like vines and trees, right? We need the air to get the drops to the canopy. We also need the air to open up the canopy to increase our spray penetration into the canopy. And for some sprayers like air shear sprayers, the, it, the fan actually creates the droplets. It atomizes the drops, but there's a cost to that. We need power to move the fan. It's, it's um, a great suck for our, our horsepower um, because the fan needs to work against drag. We need to have high speed air leaving the fan and it quickly drops off. And we know if we have too much air, for example, if the fan's too big, or the canopy too small, or we're driving too slow, we can blast those droplets right through the canopy and or cause a phenomena called shingling. And shingling is basically when the leaves are layered on top of each other and you can't penetrate inside the canopy. Drift is also a consequence of too much air. If we have too little air, if the fan is too small or the canopy too big, or we're driving too fast, then we'll, you also won't have an effective application. So we know we need to look at three things to properly determine our, our speed. We need to look at the, the, we need to measure the speed, but we also need to look at it in conjunction with the canopy and the fan. And I bet some of you are wondering, well, what fancy tool do I have to buy to, uh, to be able to set proper speed? And, you know, and 
here it is, folks, a $3 roll of flagging tape. And, and it's true that this that something as simple as flagging tape is probably one of the one of the most critical pieces of, of equipment that you need to properly calibrate other than water sensitive paper. So what we do with the flagging tape is we tie it on the opposite side of the canopy from which we're traveling down the row here. So, and we tie it, basically we wanna make sure that the flagging is on the opposite side of where we're looking for good coverage. So obviously in the fruit zone, right about here would be the uh, critical place, but we also know that we need to have our protectants on the leaf surface as well. So we wanna see what our, um, what our coverage is gonna be um, throughout the canopy. So we tie the, the ribbon on the other side of the canopy and we drive down the aisle row at this determined speed that we think we wanna use with the fan setting at what we think we wanna use. And then we observe how the, this flagging flutters. And that tells us something about how the air is penetrating the canopy because where the air goes, the spray drops are gonna go. So you don't need any spray, you don't use any spray on, all your nozzles are off, you're just running air. And you can, you can infer by looking at how the ribbons move. So if the ribbons are moving up here um, at, at between say 45 and 90 degrees, that's telling us that there's too much air or the air is going too fast, right? And we'd wanna perhaps decrease the fan or drive faster. Now, what we want is for the flagging to be fluttering at about 25 to 45 degrees, right here in this, ooh, air just right sweet spot, right? So right about there, I'm happy with how that flagging is fluttering. That's telling me that that air is getting through the canopy, but it's not being pushed through too forcefully. If that flagging is not, is less than, um, than 25 degrees or zero, or not fluttering much at all, then we need to increase the fan or drive slower. Okay, so, so we're setting our, our speed and we're looking at our fan um, using the flagging. And, and you know, when we do these early season sprays, it's kind of uh, funny, isn't it? That you'd think that it would be so easy to get good coverage early season. But in reality, we, we're lacking the canopy to capture our spray. So we need to think carefully, strategically about our early settings. And this is a key, key time for mildew control. This is what sets the game for the whole rest of the season. So, and this is a time where we really need to look at using larger drops and less fan for better coverage. And slower air can be desirable, okay? So because it provides better coverage on the backside. Um, so slower air will tend to wrap around the target where fast air tends to slipstream around the target and can miss the backside completely. Anyone who's done a, an oil application and looked at the, at the coverage, which is very obvious after you do an oil application, right? Because it takes off the bloom. You can see the underside, you can, you can turn the bunches around. You can see how your coverage did on the backside. You know what I'm talking about. It's very hard to get good coverage on the backside of the fruit. So consider slowing down your air. How do we do that? Well, if you have a fan gearbox, so if you have an axial fan sprayer, um, you can simply use a gearbox and you can turn it to low. Sometimes that's not enough though. And we can employ a strategy called gear up throttle down. This is a strategy that was originally developed by a couple of University of Nebraska extension agents in the late seventies as a means to save diesel fuel when tractors were pulling implements. And it goes like this. We reduce our tractor RPMs, which in turn reduces our PTO RPMs. Um, and we gear up to maintain or speed up our ground speed. In so doing, we keep going, we have our speed, um, but we've lessened the RPMs of the fan. So we slowed the fan even, we can slow it even more so than, um, than using a gearbox. So this is a strategy that's only for PTO uh, uh, driven sprayers. It's not for centrifugal pumps, air shear sprayers. It's not to be used in hilly terrain or, or in, in places where you'd have trouble with um, lugging. Okay, so 
I want to talk quickly now about um, some options for large drops. Okay, so for if you have a hydraulic nozzle sprayer, not an air shear sprayer, but a hydraulic nozzle sprayer, we do now have low drift nozzles available. They've been available for years. They've been used in Europe for years. Uh, we don't yet see these used much in uh, California, but I'm here to tell you they're they they are an option for you. So um, here we don't have the fan operated in this picture because you can see the droplet size so much better without the fan operating. So on this side, we have typical disc and core nozzles. And on this side, we have a low drift air induction TX nozzle uh, made by T-Jet. They're also made by other nozzle manufacturers. So this is an AI TX. It's got uh, inlet port for air that causes negative pressure inside the nozzle chamber introducing these air bubbles into the liquid stream. And those air bubbles ask, act as sort of cushions. So what those large droplets tend to not bounce when they hit the leaf tissue. Um, so it kind of cushions the droplet so that they don't bounce. Okay, another reason to consider using larger drops. I mean, I think we all, most of us understand that small drops move very easily off target with air and wind, but they also evaporate. And, you know, as we're finding that we're, you know, we're pressed to do our spraying midday in, in, in high temperatures, and we have these heat waves going through, have to consider that, the, that those drops are evaporating, those tiny drops. In fact, in this chart here um, that I've gathered from Air Blast 101, which is my friend Jason DeVoe's latest edition of his, um, his manual, which I highly recommend, available online. You can Google it. Um, you can see here how the original droplet diameters uh, evaporate to a third the size in seconds. So, you know, those droplets have to be large enough to reach the target, right? So the question is, do low drift nozzles work, right? And I, I've, uh, I've seen data from Europe. They're commonly used in Europe, data looking at powdery mildew control, such as this from Emilio Gill at Catalonia, Spain, showing that he saw no difference between low drift nozzles and conventional nozzles in looking at the efficacy for powdery mildew in grapes. So I just thought, well, I wanna try this myself because I have people asking me, you know, do these nozzles get hung up in the canopy or, you know, how do these work? So I was able to do a little study uh, uh, in 2020 comparing conventional disc and core nozzles to these air induction nozzles. And here's what these air induction nozzles look like. Um, and this was a replicated study. And I thank my collaborator for putting up with, uh, with the spraying um, that he did that season. And I also wanna thank Akif's, Akif Eskalin and um, Karina and Marcella from Akif's lab who helped me evaluate the mildew preseason. So, um, just we so the comparison treatments were using disc and core all season long compared to using air induction for the first three sprays and then going to disc and core. So only for the first three sprays did we have a difference in treatment. For those first three sprays, the speed was kept the, the same, and we set the the flow rate to be very close. So the spray volume was very close. It was something like, um, it, was, it was fairly high because the grower was a little shy, but it was about 76 gallons per acre in the AI and um, about 73 gallons per acre in the disc and core. And when we did the pre-harvest evaluation, the upshot was we saw no difference, no statistical difference in the prevalence or severity of powdery mildew when we used the air induction nozzles compared to using the conventional nozzles. So, um, and, and so there, there you go, you have an option now. Finally, the most important thing you should do when looking at uh, your sprayer settings, and this is actually a part of calibration, is to verify those sprayer settings with water sensitive paper. So you can purchase this water sensitive paper. It's been traditionally made by Syngenta. There's other uh, uh, manufacturers making paper now. It's more readily available. You can attach it to the canopy. I like to put it where I want to see control. You can attach it in a variety of ways. I like to attach the water sensitive paper to 
um, a, a paper mailer like this. And this, um, this paper is yellow when it doesn't have any liquid on it. And as soon as the liquid hits, it turns red or blue. So you could get an idea of your spray coverage that way. And you, you can even use these, these cow tags. And this is actually the type of coverage we saw with the AI nozzles. It was pretty heavy to run off even. Thank you so much, Lynn. All right, so Mark Batney is up next and he's going to talk to us about uh, weather conditions and how they relate to drift. He is from the San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties and he is a cooperative extension advisor. Take it away, Mark. Great, thank you, Carrie. Yeah, so we'll talk about weather conditions relating to spray drift and it's, you know, both uh, Lynn and Larry have mentioned the use of fungicides for controlling powdery mildew. So clearly the use of sprays and concerns about drift has to be an important thing for us to consider as well. So pesticide labels, uh, they often caution against spraying if it's too windy or if an inversion is present. And I would consider these to be the two main factors relating to the risk of drift occurring. Um, also though, the labels will mention things about air temperature and air humidity. And the reason is as air becomes hotter and or drier, the spray droplets evaporate more quickly and they become smaller and therefore more prone to be drifting. So regardless of anything that I say in my short presentation here, always consult the label and follow what the label says as far as uh, directing you and your use of those pesticides. Uh, inversions, you know, this is something that we don't um, often uh, consider sufficiently, I, I think, in our use of pesticides and our applications of pesticides. Here's a really good picture showing you how inversion conditions can alter and influence the movement of air in the environment here. So this clearly is a, a daytime picture here. And what you can see is that there's warmer air occurring above the parcel of cold air. And why is this called an inversion? Because it's inverting the normal condition during the daytime when we have warmer air occurring near the surface and colder air as you go up in altitude. So when you have this condition of warmer air on top of colder air, that cold air is confined into that lower layer. So if you imagine trying to, with a large fan, trying to push some of this cold air up, because it's more dense, it's simply gonna to wanna to fall right back down. So this creates a very stable um, atmospheric condition. And as you can see with the air pollution here, whatever is released into that air parcel tends to stay there. So that a, a, can be a very detrimental condition. Um, but how do we know if inversion conditions exist? Uh, we often can't fly overhead like that and, and see that type of pattern. Well, we can sometimes, if there's smoke present, we can see that pattern that smoke creates. You see in that small picture there on the right, the smoke goes up and hits a layer and then just moves laterally. That's a clear sign that there's an inversion present. Formation of ground fogs. When the air near the ground is colder than the air higher up, it will be more prone to having dew form. So now we reach the dew point and then you can see that fog form. It, but that doesn't always happen. You have to have enough humidity in the air to create that condition. When there's an inversion present, the sounds and smells can be amplified. So things that normally you might not hear your neighbor's radio, but now if there's an inversion that you might be able to hear that much more clearly. So these can all be clues that there are inversion conditions present. But it's been my contention that actual measurements of these conditions would be far more useful to us. And then we could get data in real time and have it available without having to look at clouds or do or, or listen to your neighbor's radio. So how do we do this? Well, it's actually quite simple to do. Um, in this photo here, this is a weather station, part of a network that I operate in San Luis Obispo County. And it's a very conventional weather station, it has the typical sensors that you would expect, rainfall, air temperature, humidity, wind speed, and solar radiation. What's different about it is it has that 30 foot tall mast, which is then measuring the air temperature at 30 feet above the ground. So that allows us to then measure at any given point in time what the inversion condition is. So if that air temperature at 30 feet is warmer than the air temperature at five feet, that means we have an inversion. So that might be occurring, for example, at night. During the daytime, air temperature near the ground could be warmer, and then we will not have an inversion at that point in time. 
Uh, this mast, it's pretty much right now a homemade item. Uh, it's not very expensive, costs about $300 to add it to a weather station. And so this certainly could be done to any of our existing weather stations that we have at other sites. So it's not, a, it's not really an advanced technology or something very high tech here. So simply applying very simple um, measurements to gain value in the data. So as I mentioned, that's part of a network that I operate in San Luis Obispo County. Currently, I have 18 stations throughout the county here. And this map kind of shows you more or less the locations of them. Uh, right now on the map itself, just showing you some air temperature values at one point in time. Uh, from these stations, we can get real-time data for a variety of things. Uh, focus right now is the inversion and the wind speed, because that's what we want to look at for our drift risk. If you do want to look at this online, I have the link there down below, so just feel free to refer to that sometime. Um, at the moment, this network is only in San Luis Obispo County, but I will be expanding to Santa Barbara County here fairly soon. So, so how do we relate then this inversion condition and the wind speed with respect to spray drift risk? So what I've done here, I downloaded data from one of the stations over a 24 hour period. We're looking from 6 p.m. one day until 6 p.m. the following day. The blue line is the inversion condition. So the axis label for that is on the left hand side. The way to interpret that when that is a positive value, that means that the air temperature up high at 30 feet is that many degrees warmer than the air temperature at five feet. So it's, that's calculated just by subtracting the air temperature at five feet from the air temperature at 30 feet. So positive value means there is an inversion present. A negative value means there is no inversion. So the pattern you see here typically is very common that uh, during the nighttime, that's when the inversion forms here. You see that's a fairly strong inversion, about four degrees Fahrenheit. That's a significant inversion. And then soon after sunrise, that inversion goes away and then diminishes throughout the day become smaller, less, less, uh, there is no inversion after, after sunrise, basically. So now if we look at the wind speed, that's the red line with the chart axis on the right-hand side, that follows the opposite pattern at this site. So during the nighttime, very little wind, soon after sunrise, the wind speed starts to slowly pick up, and then later in the afternoon, afternoon, it becomes quite a bit stronger. So if we were trying to target a period during the daytime here or during the, the day, let's say, when there was no inversion and when the wind speed was below uh, a certain threshold value, that would be the time that I have labeled here with the green. So essentially from roughly 7 a.m. until noon or let's say 1 p.m. might be a better boundary for that. 7 to 1 p.m. in this example would have been the time period when we had the combination of both no inversion and very low wind speed. So that would have been the time period when we have been would have been most comfortable applying our sprays. So that's basically the idea behind this project would be to allow anybody to look at this website in real time and get data on what is the current inversion condition and what is the current wind speed throughout the region to just be able to make an informed decision on whether or not there is any risk to be applying uh, sprays at that point in time. And you know the reason why, of course, that drift happens I didn't want to show a map from California, but here's a map of pesticide drift cases in Iowa uh, over a time period here, 2010 to 2015. So, you know, Iowa clearly a major agricultural state. Drift happens, and these green dots are agricultural drift incidents, and the black dots are non-agricultural drift in incidents. And these are just documented cases. Chances are there are other incidents that are not shown on this map. But again, it sort of points to the uh, whole goal here is that this is something that if we have better data, maybe we can help reduce the incidence of this type of thing happening. And in the Midwest, I mean, I think all of you may read about, there's some very serious problems happening now with drift, especially of herbicide, dicamba, and things that are causing very large losses to many crops and especially to grape growers in the Midwest. They're very susceptible to a lot of those products. So I think everybody has strong interest in trying to minimize as much as we can um, any risk of drift happening. So I also wanted to show you then that a really nice solution 
that the state of Oklahoma has implemented to help people understand and manage these drift risks much better. And I just show this sort of as an inspiration to us of what direction we can start going if we choose to start having more data like this available to us. So this is the Oklahoma MISONET network. They have 120 stations throughout the state. Here, with regards to drift risk, they calculate what's called the dispersion index. You kind of think of this as combining both the inversion risk and the wind speed risk into one with some other things. But the idea is it's just a single value that tells you what the risk for drift might be at a given point in time. So higher values of dispersion index mean it's better to be applying a spray, lower values, more risk of drift occurring. So here's what they do, and it's what I really like about this is that not only can you look at real time data and historical data, but they also have a forecasting service. So here what I did, I logged into their system on one afternoon, looking at forecast conditions throughout the state for the following morning. And so here's for 6 a.m. And if you can see the scale there on the left, the low value here of one, that's very poor dispersion conditions. So this would be very high risk of drift occurring if you were to spray during this period. So you can see now the forecast throughout the state at 6 a.m. is for very high drift risk. So clearly having this data will tell a farmer, be very careful. This is not a time to be spraying here most likely because of these uniform conditions throughout the state. Moving forward here, 9 a.m. on the same day here. Well, now in the southern part of the state here, much better conditions, higher values here, good to excellent conditions for the dispersion, but higher risk in the northern part of the state. So again, very informative information. Go ahead three hours forward here to noon on the following day. Now you can see uniformly good to excellent conditions throughout the state. So if you as a grower are empowered with a forecasting tool like this, this will be very, very useful, I think, to help you decide when would be the best times to spray and when would be the times that you would want to avoid applying sprays, which is really the kind of thing that we're trying to accomplish here. Just understanding these risk conditions that much better. So if I had to summarize then our risks of spray drift uh, with our, our weather conditions, windy conditions and the presence of an inversion that will lead to problems higher risk of drift occurring the mechanisms are different but they can both lead to that, that drift occurring good dispersion conditions meaning that we don't have the wind and we don't have an inversion those are the types of conditions when we want to be applying our sprays and hopefully if we can move in a direction to actually having growers have this data available to them, that is really the best tool, I think, to make sure that we are applying our pesticides under the optimum conditions that are, we possibly can. All right, thank you all, all right. very much. Thank you. All right, so next up we have Dr. Gabriel Torres. He is going to talk to us about powdery mildew resistance, and he is from Tulare and Kings Counties. Okay. okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank so you. yes, we're gonna talk today about powder mildew. First, I want to announce that I'm leaving UCNR today. So this is my last presentation, but I want to thank all my colleagues and viticulture advisors and also my IPN colleagues for all your support and also all growers for your support. It has been a really nice experience. Okay. We're going to okay. miss you. <laughs> and I'm going to miss you. So before talking about, before I start talking about the fungicide uh, resistance, uh, I want to tell you that not always uh, fungicide fails because you have resistance. There's a lot of things involved in a pesticide application that can make a uh, fail a spray. So most of the time we use water, 99.99 of the times that we spray, uh, we use water. And water have different characteristics. Between them, we have a pH, so that is really important. And most of the uh, pesticides are developed to work between pH 4 and 6.5. Some herbicide like glyphos glyphosate can work in pH, uh, requires pH above 7. But the range, the optimal range, will be between 4 and 6.5. So if you have a 
water with a higher pH, you need to take this in account. Uh, other factor is that maybe you mix in the wrong order. So there is a order for how to spray the pesticides. So first you, you want the water uh, soluble uh, pesticides and at the end you will add uh, the surfactant. So take in account as Mark said before with the label, see which, which one can you mix and which is the order to do it in a correct way? Or you can use the wrong equipment or your equipment could be broken. So you need to test it before go out to a spray to be, you need to know that everything is gonna work as planned. There is a adverse environmental conditions. Mark was talking about in inverse layers, but also uh, Larry mentioned when uh, we have a very cold temperature, so far doesn't work as expected. Or uh, we have rain, like in 2019, we have a lot of rain in the May of May, in May. So that makes uh, things a little bit challenging. So we need to take in account what's going on. Or well, we are applying at the wrong physiological stage. Maybe we are uh, identify a pass that maybe is affecting a, a bloom and we sprayed a pre-bloom. So that's a run selection of the, of the pesticide. Uh, we need to know uh, when the pathogen is present for powdery mildew, we're gonna, yes, it's gonna start a bad break that they start to grow, but for the spray to be really effective, maybe you want to start to, to spray when it's around six inches in length and from pre-bloom to very set is a critical, a window that is at the time when maybe you want to include a systemic fungicide in your, in your program. Lane also mentioned about the necessity of do a right calibration of the equipment. So those components are really important. Also the operator of the, of the sprayer is really important. He needs to be trained what to do if something goes wrong, uh, how to to do all what is uh, is necessary to to good uh, to have a good coverage, and from the pesticide side, yes, many things can can fail. Maybe we select the wrong pesticide; it's not targeting the pest that we really have in the field. So, a, a right, a correct identification of the pest is necessary. Uh, maybe you we identify the the right pest, but maybe select the right pesticide. Maybe we are having a we are targeting something that affects the mycelia growth, but we select something that just interrupt the uh, uh, spore penetration. So something that needs to be considered. Uh, maybe don't go with the label and maybe use a sub dose. This is really bad, for, especially for resistance, using something that is uh, lower than the label say, maybe it's not illegal, but for the IPM standpoint of view is really bad because uh, pathogens can become resistant very, very fast if you use some, something very, very low. And over those, it's gonna take you into trouble. So if you want to be out of trouble, so please don't use a dose that is higher than is, is saying the label. Or maybe you can mix with an compatible compound. So read the label and before any spray, if it, there is not information about the if two uh, compounds are compatible or not, use a, a, a tank uh, test before, before spray it. And the last one is when we use a pesticide that on a population that is resistant to that uh, pesticide. So that's why we want to talk today. So resistance is pretty much the ability uh, to not be affected by something, especially if it's adverse to us. Uh, this is a fungi, a plant, a phytophthora on a plate, and every single of these strips are the same uh, isolate. And in the plate, I have uh, some fungicide. And as you can see here, this one is not affected at any dose. So that specific uh, fungi is resistant to that specific fungicide. 
So if we talk about bugs, maybe we can say that the white population is a, a sensible population and the red ones, the red bugs are uh, resistant. We use over and over the, the orange uh, fungicide in our case for powdery mildew. The red population starts to establish and start to go up and is not affected by the, by the fungicide. So that's when it come in action, the pesticide rotation concept that we need to switch between mode of action to control a, a, a pest or a disease. So in this case, I just painted like orange and blue and the red population is affected by the blue. And at the end, what we want to have is maybe a, to get rid of, of our pest. It's not gonna happen with other mildew, it is ubiquitous you know, uh, grape growing areas, but we can have it in a very low level if we do the right things. But resistance uh, doesn't work in a single way. There is two types of resistance. There is one that is qualitative, that I guess is like a switch, it's like on off. And when it appears, all the descendants become a uh, resistance. So a good example is QOIs of RAC11 that is a, uh, very wide spread uh, resistance in powdery mildew. Another way, especially when you have a multi gene, uh, a multiple genes involved in the resistance, is quantitative. So it's, it starts to slow down. It's more like a gradient where you can see that your product this year worked pretty good. Next year, maybe works good, but not as good as expected. The next year is something that you're not sure how, how good. The was and in the four years doesn't work at all at all. So, so that is quantitative because it's not like on off and it's not one and zero. So you can see like a gradient there. And it's a typical uh DMIs is a good example, SDHI, a frac 13, phenoxifen are good examples of that that resistance. So normally fungicide target a, a specific part of the cell. In this case, I just put like a pizza shape that goes into that to complete the circle. And when you get there and you have the, when they match, it, the fungicide can be in action and control the, the pathogen. So that's why I draw the, the cell like gray, like demonstrating that maybe it's that. But, it's pretty common that uh, pathogens evolve, they mutate and create a, they just modify the, the binding site. It's the most common type of resistance for fungicide resistance uh, in plants, uh, in fungi, I mean. And so in that case, uh, our target is modified and, with it, and our fungicide doesn't bind in the, in the right place. So, all these groups are examples for powdery mildew resistance. In RAG1, the lensimidazol, DMIs, QIs, and SDHIs. Also mentioned kinoxifen. Uh, and the thing is that uh, uh, we need to, to know which is the mode of action, how every uh, fungicide works. So when we're talking about uh, fungicide, uh, rotation, we need to change the mode of action, not the name of the product. There are products with this, uh, different names, but the same group, maybe not the same uh, chemical family, but they act in the cell affecting the same part of the, of the, of the cell. So for powdery mildew, we have a FRAC 7 and 11 affects respiration. FRAC 11, that is the QIs, have a really high risk of, of the low resistance. SDHI have a, a medium, but also if we overuse SDHI, we're gonna have a resistance pretty soon. Uh, FRAC3, DMIs, and 17, they affect the, the membrane. Kinoxifen affects the signal transduction. Some of them, the sulfur are multi site they affect different parts of the uh, of the pathogen process, uh, biology, and there is some products that we don't know how they how they work, which uh, pathway they interfere with. But 
we know by using in other models, other pathogens, how fast they, they can uh, develop resistance. So we know that the uh, Ciflufamid, Torino, uh, develops resistance really fast. Metrophenone, Vivandum, maybe is a uh, mid risk to develop resistance. But any times, it doesn't matter if it has a, a medium or high, the message is that we need to do rotation of mode of actions. How do we know that we have a, a, which mode of action do we have? So we go to the label and by law, all the fungicide has which group they belongs to. So in this case, Aban is our QOI. And I bring this one, not because uh, it's, a, it's a good fungicide, but we know that we have a very high number of cases of resistance to QIs or FRAC 11. This is a, a FRAC, the Fungicide Resistant Action Committee uh, classification. So they, they have a poster when you can look for different mode of actions. If we have a closer look about the respiration for powdery mildew, we have a FRAC 11, a FRAC 7. I just color this in red because they did have a really high chance to develop resistance. In FRAC 7 is, is, a, is medium, so I just paint with a different colors. And it's not the rotation from one uh, QI to another QI. If we want to do a rotation is from one QI maybe to, to one SDHI and then to another group. So maybe here, can we see in a better way, maybe from a group seven, we go to, to a group, uh, I think it's uh, nine, then move to an, Another group 13, group seven, group 15, group three. And that's how we move, moving from one place to another. We can come back in some cases to, to the same product, but at least we need to put another mode of action between uh, two sprays. And Larry made a really good description of, about how useful this software. I just bring again, I, here, just to show that sulfur is a very good ally to reduce uh, resistance. You can put in tank, in tank mix, or as we do in table graves, is that one week we go with the synthetic and next week, seven days before we go with sulfur. And we go that way during the season, especially within that uh, period of time that I told you between pre bloom, maybe to very set is critical, but in table graves, we take care uh, at least until the horizon. But it's not only the to the fungicides are not only the ones that are gonna make uh, help us to take care of powder in view. We need to implement uh, cultural practices like leafing. So canopy management is critical. Lynn mentioned that in her presentation. It has several advantages for us. Not only gonna uh, improve airflow, but it's also let us to improve a uh, fungicide penetration. It's gonna reduce uh, humidity, which is detrimental to the pathogen. So don't expect a fungicide to do the work by itself. There is not a magic bullet. There is not a fungicide that is gonna, that you're gonna spray once and it's gonna, you're gonna forget about powder mildew. Powder mildew is gonna be there always. So you need to go and take care of your vineyard every time. I'm just gonna present a scale that we use to evaluate different uh, fungicides. So we evaluate uh, canopy and also clusters. Table gauge, we are more focused on clusters, but we evaluate a uh, lot of them. So we have a healthy, we classify it as grade one. Grade two is less than five lesions. Grade three between five and 20. And when we have more than 20, it's grade four for leaves. And when we have one between 1% 1 and five is gonna be grade two for clusters. And between five and 12 is gonna be grade three. And above that is gonna be grade four because in a lesson table grades, uh, everything that is above that is not gonna get into the market. This is a good picture about powder mildew, maybe if you don't know the pathogen, you can say, oh, we only have one, two, three, four, and maybe five 
the colonies, but all those uh, yellowing patches here is the mildew uh, growing in the cell. So if I have to rate this, this leaf for me is grade four and not grade one. This is the aspect of a severe infection on, on wine grapes. You can see it affects not only the canopy, the berries, but also all the stems. So it's very, very aggressive if we leave it unattended. This is a result from our, of our plot. So at the beginning of the year, we don't have too, too much incidence. And in July, it just explodes exponentially. The only treatment that we have that continue growing is still a very low a level, three berries per on 15 vines was a very uh, stupid uh, scientific rotation that we did just to take as control was we just rotate rally with Quintec every single spray. So six spray rotating rally, Quintec, rally, Quintec, and it didn't work. Uh, for the rest, we have a good control, especially by the end of, of July. And in, in August, September, we were able to control the disease. Let me show this result. That is what is happening in California. The orange is the resistant population. And what's going on here in California is that at the beginning, we have no resistant population. And around July, everything switched to resistance. So resistance is happening very fast. Uh, this is, if you want to look what's going on in California, you can go to Frame Networks at Washington State University, WDU. We are collaborating with them, collecting samples from, from the whole country, and you can see what's going on with resistance. So a lot of resistance isolates in the country. So the best practice is coverage and rotation. Thank you so much, Dr. Torres, for that great overview of resistance to powdery mildew. The next presentation we have is Dr. Akif Eskelin. He's our resident plant pathologist. And he's with the University of California Cooperative Extension. He's a specialist. So he's going to talk to us today about all of this on the ground, the efficacy of various products for managing powdery mildew in vineyards. Take it away, Akif. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about the efficacy of the, um, the various um, uh, products for managing powdery mildew in vineyards. So this is the collaborative uh, work uh, that we have done with uh, Karina Elfar, postdoctoral scholar in my laboratory, uh, Samuel Wells, uh, Karen Alarcon, and Pawan Pai, Marcela Bustamanta, and Molly Arakin. They are the all technician and graduate student in my laboratory. So they all uh, work in this uh, project in different times. I just wanna uh, mention a little bit like the spore trapping and the importance. The spore trapping can be done with different tools and equipments. The most important part is that the, how you can get the simultaneous uh, number of the supports from the beginning to the end of the growing season of the grapevine. So these are the, a few pictures of the different spur trapping techniques that can be used or utilized. It's quite expensive uh, method. The, all the supports that's being trapped has to be identified uh, by uh, molecular identification techniques to give you an idea. Today, I'm going to talk to you about mostly the importance of the spore trapping uh, at the beginning of the, of the season. So uh, I just wanna go back and uh, Lynn uh, give you a great uh, information about the, what the asexual or sexual um, the reproduction of the powdery mildew is that the, I just wanna revisit and then remind you a couple of the, uh, the items. So cosmotesia is the, is the, uh, the sexual reproduction, um, the, the part of the powdery mildew that's also known as the overwintering structure. So uh, these are happening right now as we are going through the harvest at the end of the, the mildew season. And then they are just gonna come up uh, the, the beginning of the season uh, next year. So it's very important. So these are the, the, the 
the cosmotasia. The, each cosmotasia has several of the, the ossi, as you can see this structure, and then each ossi would contain up to eight ascospores. These ascospores are able to produce infection on the healthy plant part and then start continue uh, doing the, their infection. In a way, if I have to give you a, a kind of like the structural way of asexual reproduction in this picture is that the, let's say one single ascospore or conidium could land onto the leaf tissue. Within the short time, it just start producing a conidium germination tube, as you can see here. So that turned into the apressorium within a short time, and then to make hostorium to get into the cell tissue, to be able to get nutrient and water that the rest of the, um, the, the, the mycelium would need it. Within a short time, once they are done with the, their hostorium development, they start producing their secondary mycelium that will end up the, the conidia for, um, uh, as you can see here, uh, more than one uh, conidium would be like the chain that turned into the hundred. These cycles, as you can see, from one to the hundred can, if the conditions are right, turn into the within the five days. So that's very important. The, the identification of the first um, spore release from the cosmotasia is important. That will give you an idea about the, whether you start having the powdery mildew infection in the air and also the, the conditions of the mildew, um, um, the, the spores relation. So that will also help you start monitoring and then developing the, your, um, the index uh, that my colleagues uh, talk to you about. It. So it's very important, um, the concept and then uh, part of the support trapping in each uh, the microclimate area has been done uh, by the UCNR IPM, um, the, the, the colleagues, uh, we all as a co UC Corporate, Corporate Extension uh, specialists are involved uh, with this process. Um, and then uh, this is a kind of service uh, that a UC system provides to our, our growers. If you don't control, or if you don't realize the, 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 the initial infection, so as you could see the, these pictures before, so it can turn into the, uh, a lot of um, the conidia supports on the leaves that could be a very difficult to con uh, con take the under control with the, with the fungicide or, or biocontrol agents. So uh, my laboratory takes the uh, field fungicide efficacy trial, uh, which is uh, at a trial that has been originally uh, established by, uh, by late Dr. Gubler, um, the, the, who has been uh, also uh, done a lot of work on the powdery mildew, powdery mildew index, all kinds of studies. I was postdoc um, uh, uh, under uh, his supervision a long time ago. And then um, now um, I was lucky enough to, to, to sit on his uh, uh, chair uh, to continue talking about the powdery mildew, uh, it's, it's very honored. So this is the, um, the the program that has been started by by him, and then that has been continued um, the, the, the being done uh, by our department. So the the one of the reason or a few reasons that I would like to talk to you about the, like the, the that we do the, these feed fungicide trial. So a lot of uh, the 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 companies are are producing many different uh, pesticide, fungicide, biocontrol agents. And then uh, they would like to see, uh, they have done apparently a lot of studies in their laboratories or in their um, development states, but they would like to see if they are gonna perform in a good perform in the field. As a UC Cooperative Extension, we are uh, being a middleman uh, between the uh, company products and also um, the, the, for the farmers, we set up the, these trials in the field and then 
present results and then tell them uh, what uh, product is working better or worse or what are the situations. So these information uh, are available online uh, in our uh, lab website or also uh, department website. I'm gonna give you that information a little bit later on. So um, this is the uh, my third year that I have been taking over the, this position and then I've been running the, this uh, powdery mildew uh, fungicide trial. So the, as experimental design, uh, we are using the randomized complete block design with the four replicates. We usually do the five replicates, but we, this year, uh, we had a limited number of the wines and then we reduced it to the four replicates, which still gives you a good amount of the, of the, of the confidence results. We used two adjacent wines as a one plot and then, and then repeated four times. So these are the information about the, what we do. And uh, as a volume per acre, which you have also heard a lot from my colleagues that the, at the beginning, we use 50 gallon uh, per acre amount of the of the of the the spray uh, coverage to get enough coverage at the beginning of the uh, of the, the the vegetative growth. In late April, uh, in this time, we turn into the 100 gallon, and late May uh, turn into 150 gallon uh, per acre. Of course, we adjust our uh, amount of the, uh, the, the, the fungicide that we use based on the, this uh, amount of the gallon that we use. So we use uh, still our SR430 and mist blower backpack sprayer, which uh, gives us a, a good um, uh, amount of the coverage. Uh, if I may, I'm gonna show you a short video uh, to just to explain you um, how we do it. So these are the, like the, the one of the plot uh, that we spray in this the early stage. And um, the, 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 this backpack sprayer is uh, giving us a, a, a the very good um, coverage from the beginning uh, until the end. At the end, we evaluate uh, these each, um, the, 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 the treatments uh, in each side. So this is the, is the two dramatic um, the differences between the uh, spray with chemical, the one on the left is control. Uh, so you can see that the dramatic um, the differences uh, between the uh, applied or not applied uh, pesticide. Uh, so based on the, these information, so we got uh, the, our results. So this is our, our trial map um, that, that shows you the, how we randomize uh, each one of them. Uh, so to, based on the, these um, uh, map, we do the, our spray, um, the evaluation, and, and, and uh, all kinds of activities. And then each grapevine in here is, is um, labeled with the flag. So uh, when we are going out for spraying, the way that we can identify them uh, based on the, their label. So this, this is our spray program. Uh, this year we started uh, the spraying uh, these fungicide in April uh, until the end of the July. So each time when we spray in each um, the product or treatments, we just uh, put them in our schedule. So that was, was the, the information that is available uh, for everyone. So when it comes to data collection, um, a sign of the powdery mildew uh, that we observed um, in the middle of the May on leaves in this plot and in the middle of the June on the berries. So I'm gonna show you the, uh, the, the risk index in this area that the, we had relatively uh, low level of the, uh, the disease pressure this year because of the, 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 the heat and then uh, dry air. Uh, that we had in um, uh, Yolo County, this area. So powdery mildew incidence and severity were assessed in each treatment by evaluating the 25 randomly chosen clusters. Uh, I show you the, some of the, those pictures. So incidence was defined as the portion of the cluster in a plot having some symptoms or sign of the powdery mildew um, in that case. So severity was determined by estimating the percentage of the area of the cluster, that is the, the severity 
uh, of the infestation. And then, uh, of course, um, we calculated them and uh, tested with the statistical analysis and then presented those uh, results. Of course, in each side, uh, we have our average daily temperature, precipitation, and, and uh, the, the, the relative humidity data. So we also collected this year. In May, we had um, unusual rain event, and then uh, the temperature was a um, little bit higher in time to time. But um, in most of the cases, it was suitable for development of the powder medium. So this is the risk index in, in this area, uh, as Lynn um, mentioned you about like the, how to read the risk index. So if the risk index is below the 30, um, uh, the, the risk of having the powdery mildew in your area is very low. You gotta uh, just skip the, uh, the powdery mildew spray or increase your intervals. If the index is between 30 and 60, you have an intermediate uh, risk of the powdery mildew, uh, you should be on top of the, your spray and um, the, the interval could be every two weeks, depending on the, what you are applying. However, when the, when the, uh, the index is above the, the 60, which is the red line here, you have a high, um, the, the risk of the, 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 the mildew in this time, you have to increase your intervals and then uh, a little bit uh, play with then the top of the, with your program, and then you don't wanna miss any spray during the, this um, high risk index time. So in this trial, um, uh, we just showing the your showing you the the the, 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 the index. Uh, however, we didn't follow because we just wanted to follow the uh, the the what the uh, the the company's uh, labels would recommend in regular condition uh, for our growers. So um, the cities are the results. Um, that says these results are, are available online if you would like to know uh, more about it. I just wanna show you that, uh, so this is the percentage of prevalence and this is the percentage of the severity. So these are the, 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 the statistical analysis by the group with the, every ladder is the together that means there is no statistical differences among the, these treatments. As you can see also the percentage value, which is on the left side of the, those alphabets, everything is zero. That means regardless of the, which one is first or second, I would recommend you to, to look at the, these uh, ladders. If everything is in the same ladder, that means there is no statistical uh, differences among the, these uh, treatments. I just wanna show you that uh, we also had uh, several standards. Uh, one of the standard was the individual chemical standard, which is not recommended in the, in the, the, the uh, regular application. We just wanted to have the single standard compared with the other uh, program. So this is the, uh, our second one is the program standard, which means we apply uh, different uh, frac group of the chemical in each spray time uh, in the, within the 14 day uh, intervals. So we also wanted to compare uh, all the other chemicals with the standard. We also have a soft standard, which is, uh, I will show you later on, it doesn't, um, uh, good, it doesn't do the good controlling, it's in, the, uh, in my other slides. So when you look at the, the, the chemical um, individual or, or combined program standards, it looks, it works better. So as uh, you heard Gabriel uh, in his presentation is that the, so now uh, in not only in California, but all the Western states, we have been dealing with the, with the resistance, uh, say uh, again, the strobilin group of the fungicide. Because of that, it is real right now, it's happening right now. And then uh, we would uh, strongly recommend if you have to apply the chemical, you have to uh, go with the program to uh, confuse the uh, powdery mildew to, to prevent the, that kind of uh, resistance. So um, as um, uh, you heard um, um, uh, Larry talk about the importance of the sulfur, which you are gonna see some of the like, like the um, uh, micronized uh, sulfur uh, with, the, with the several different other combination uh, work very well. Uh, so if you are uh, organic and if you like to go with the 
uh, some of those, um, the, 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 the micronized solvers, uh, you can get more information about um, uh, those, uh, which one worked, which one didn't work very well. Again, uh, you gotta be careful about the uh, application of the uh, sulfur uh, combination with the uh, oil-based products that uh, in certain time when the temperature is, is, is uh, over 90, uh, they could cause some, um, uh, the, the phytotoxicity, not only leaves, but also fruit, which is the uh, most important uh, part. So there are some products um, that hasn't been registered. Uh, some of those companies would like to see how they perform. Uh, they don't want to uh, uh, reveal the, their uh, formula, uh, but that means uh, based on these results, uh, those products are going to be registered uh, soon, and then that those are going to be available for our growers to uh, uh, use uh, alternate. So again, uh, in here, uh, we see the um, uh, good um, efficacy with the, uh, some of the oil-based products. Uh, with this year, uh, we mix um, the oil with the, um, with the sulfur. Uh, we try to do the tank mix uh, to see if we can uh, get away with the uh, phytotoxicity when we apply in the early stage or earliest in the season before the heat comes out. So some of the, those treatments were successful. Uh, some of them that we continue spraying uh, cause some uh, phytotoxicity on the grape. So what I'm trying to say is that the, if you know, um, the, make sure that the, um, the, the, the combine uh, your treatments with the, the climatic or weather data, make sure that you are not spraying in the, in the high temperature, uh, some of those uh, sulfur or, or oil-based products that could cause some uh, phytotoxicity. Again, uh, we have uh, some uh, um, the, the other new products. Um, uh, they are the organic-based uh, products. Again, uh, we are not allowed to reveal the, their, their formula right now, but what I'm uh, trying to say here is that the, if you have the, uh, the, 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 the organic products with um, uh, some of the, um, the, the either copper or, or organically acceptable uh, product, uh, they perform uh, very well to control the uh, disease. Of course, without seeing the control or level of the, um, the, the disease pressure, um, it is very difficult to see which one is working, which one is not working here, okay? So in here, um, uh, the, the ladder is going down and then turning into the uh, AB, which means that as a, from now on, uh, all the treatments um, seems to be uh, statistically uh, the difference uh, between uh, each treatment. So, so I just wanna, uh, I just want you to follow up on those um, uh, as well. So, um, sorry about that. So uh, at the end, um, some of those treatments, as I mentioned that the, one of our uh, biological treatment um, uh, didn't uh, perform very well uh, this year, um, as well as the, some other um, the plant extract and also some of the biocontrol agents uh, didn't work itself when you apply. So that's why uh, Serenade is, is uh, well known, um, the, the, the product that works to control the powdery mildew, but uh, it is recommended that uh, you gotta apply uh, these, uh, the, the, the beaker, um, the biocontrol agents with the, uh, with the, uh, with the program uh, to increase their efficacy. So that, that's the one. So at the end, this is the untreated control. Uh, we had a, a very good um, level of the infestation, uh, disease pressure to be able to compare um, the, these results with the, with the others. So at the end of the, each um, uh, trial, uh, we have a field day uh, that um, we invite all the company representatives uh, as well as the pest control advisors uh, UC cooperative extensions and then and then growers. Last year we didn't have the field day because of the um, the restriction with the COVID nineteen. Uh, this year we had it, but it was a little bit limited. Um, so we each year we had these uh, results presented in the field. So you are all welcome uh, to join our next uh, field day um, um, uh, next year. So uh, all these information and reports are being reported, uh, not only this year, but also last 30 years that has been done by uh, Dr. Gubler. 
if you go to my lab website or our department website, uh, so you can go to the fruit crop fungicide efficacy trials. So in that site, not only powdery mildew, but also you will have the results from the other, um, the, 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 the crops that we have been doing the fungicide trial. So that will be the information that you'll get. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you for paying attention. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you, UC Ag experts and UCIPM for bringing this whole thing together. Like I said, this all started with a farm call. So, and then we all spoke to each other and we're like, maybe it's time for a powdery mildew webinar. So this is really a great, I think it's been very informative. Um, okay, so we have a question here. It says, do you see a relationship between dust on the vines and grapes and mildew? Would dust on the vines and grapes affect the efficacy of your spray program? Who would like to take that one? I can partly answer that uh, question. Um, I don't think um, the, the dust would affect that much because what you are doing is that the, you are putting a good amount of the, uh, the water uh, with the chemical. So when we are um, applying with 50 gallon in the beginning, 100 and 150. So as you are doing, that is similar of, as, a, as a grower, you are kind of like putting a good amount of the water. So I would say if you are dealing with a lot of dust on the surface of the, of the grapevine, you may increase your, uh, the, 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 the amount of the gallon that you put that make sure that you are washing off to that dust first and then also applying. But of course, you have to apply this one within the limit of the label uh, that you do. But I don't see a, a, a dust is being problem. For the for the coverage, I don't know if anyone else has the uh, another opinion. That I haven't heard that kind of question before, but yes, it's a question. Thank you. Uh, I haven't heard that either of dust being a problem for mildew applications. I mean, so. But valid point with the water as well. You know, I I do have in my county, we're starting to see a reduction in the amount of water that's used on certain spray applications. So water does play a role. Thank you very much, Lynn and Aki, for your input on that. Our next question is regarding the disease triangle. Do you think using abiotic stress products like leach, sodium, chloride, et cetera, can help mitigate the effects of the environment? This one goes on for a while. So should I just read the whole thing or you want me to take it piece by piece? I'll keep going. You go what ahead. About, read that again. Okay. What about total nutrition to maintain a healthy plant or create a stronger host? Adjuvants or products that can create a barrier to disease or products that can reflect light and lower leaf surface temperatures to avoid the sour spot for germ, uh, spore germination. Should one or all of these strategies be used to counterattack the disease triangle? i.e. make it harder for the disease to thrive before using pesticides to go after the pathogen. Okay, if no candidate, I can partly answer this question. It's a, it's a long question, number of things that that's a kind of repeat, but I'm gonna, this is what I'm, how I'm gonna answer it. When you are talking about the powdery mildew percentage, when you look at the disease triangle, host is susceptible, one host, and then we have the pathogen, specific the host and then it's available. The, the, of course, the, the stress and susceptibility of the host is, host is very important, but when it comes to powdery mildew, environmental condition is the one that kicks out. out. So those are like the most important part. So because of that, I will focus on the environmental uh, stress or differences than the host pathogen. Great points. I, I think a healthy plant is, is great to have, um, but certainly uh, Vitus vinifera in particular is highly susceptible in general to, to uh, powdery mildew, and we just have a conducive environment. So yeah. It, it, yeah, it's a combination of all things that are that's going to benefit your practice. Is yeah. the idea that, oh, Can sorry. I add something there? Please do. Yes, uh, I think that always as, as farmers, we want to have healthy plants. Healthy plants means 
a good yield. So I have uh, two experiment, two sites. One is uh, has healthy plants. The other one is the, don't have the best practices. And you can see difference in uh, mildew incidence in the health in the healthy ones or the ones that is really good at fertilizer. Uh, you see a lot of powdery mildew because you have a big canopy. You have a big clusters, good number of clusters. The other one has a poor canopy, so that means that we have a very good airflow there. And mildew there is very reduced, but but they have other problems. So not only yield. So I think that is uh, part of well, what we want to do as, as growers. So is this a real business or is this a vineyard that we just have for fun and we can take care of it if we don't have enough time. Uh, about the, uh, this is triangle. I think that some of those uh, practices was really modified is the environment. Maybe it's not the general environment where the plant is, but the, the local environment at, at the leaf, uh, level, you can change it and it's how some of those products works. So that's why they may be help to, to reduce the infection. Very great points. Uh, health, healthy plants are good, but, but there's a threshold to that, right? We don't want too much overgrowth. We don't want, um, you know, in some cases, fertilizer, too much nitrogen can can make peaches soft. And Akif, were you going to add to that? I saw your microphone turn off. No, I was getting ready for the next one. What do you think about oil applications instead of sulfur for powdery mildew control? Although Larry might also be able to speak to that as well. Yeah, so we've used uh, sulfur or wet or uh, oils uh, in the early season, and they pretty much do the same thing, uh, or you can achieve the same level of control. But they both have their strengths and weaknesses. And so the oils are very good eradicants, especially early season when the canopies are very open. You get uh, you can get very good control of uh, any infections that are occurring, but the downside of oils is that they have no or very little residual effect. And so depending on how, how frequently you're, you're applying those, you do have a window there where you might get new infections. So that's uh, opposed to the wettable sulfur that might be done early season. Uh, you have a better residual control, but we've done both. And uh, in comparison, they're Kind of equivalent products. And so, especially, you know, Doug Googler and I did a lot of work, uh, uh, especially very early, you know, bud break, uh, one inch growth type uh, treatments of and comparing oil and uh, wettable sulfur. And we get similar levels of suppression of uh, those early infections with those treatments. And so, it's really kind of dependent on preference. Um, if you come in late and know you have infections, then I think sometimes the oils are better because they probably are the better eradicate. Um, if you come in and you're timing your early applications prior to those infections, probably won't see much difference if, uh, if those are applied. And, you know, as long as the coverage is good, I think they're both effective products for early season applications. Thank One you. thing there with, with the oil is that uh, you also need to be careful with temperature. So always yeah. check your forecast and look that you don't going to have temperatures above 90 degrees because you're going to fry your plants. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, and the additional the other thing is it depends on what you have on your plants. And so I've seen people fry things with oils because they had uh, other chemical residues on the plant. And so the, the other thing with the oils, they're very good penetrants. And so if you've got certain nutrients on the plants as a residue, uh, you can see issues with increased potential for burn. Thank you. All right, next question. And they're bouncing around on me a little bit. Has there been any work done on temperature-based timing of sulfur applications? I have an old document with work done in 81 and wonder if it is common knowledge or if there have been any changes over time. Well, I think that probably refers to some of the work that Marianne Saul did when she was at Davis. 
And uh, essentially, you know, the, uh, the risk index is kind of a take on that. And it's the same concept that uh, if you look at temperatures, you have a gauge on, uh, you know, how fast that mildew is growing and what potential there is for uh, you being in an epidemic type situation. And so your treatments are either ratchet up or you relax them based on that, 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 uh, that model. So, I mean, I think they're, they're kind of, we still are doing that to a certain extent. There probably could be improvements on it. And so some people think that as well as it seems to have worked well in California, there's other areas where people say they don't think it works as well. And so maybe under those conditions, a better model or a different model may uh, better give them uh, those growers a gauge on, on what the potential growth rate uh, of the pathogen is. Thank you, and, and certainly don't spray if it's too hot, right? Or not, don't don't apply oh. sulfur if it's too hot. Okay, the next one. Curious about the danger of any mildew and or mold on cuttings after pruning. Since the cuttings are dead, does anything like that grow on them? So maybe stuff left in the field. Well, technically, um, powdery mildew also colonizes on the shoots or stem or outside of the green shoots, and then they they can turn into the, the things. So they can be, the cosmothecia could survive in any part of the plant, uh, the leftover leaves, leftover fruit clusters, or if they are heavily infested on the, on the, on the uh, surface of the shoots, they can also survive, sur survive on those plants as well. So it is, uh, as Lynn mentioned in, in her talk that the it is very important how much infestation that you are going to have next year. It's important how much um, you, mildew you had it this year, at the end of this year. So it's going to affect from, from this year mildew level is going to affect your next year. Therefore, you got to be um, uh, the, make sure that you are not leaving any um, the plant part that could contain uh, cosmotesia uh, for the overwintering structure. Thank you, Akif. Um, Akif, just I just wanted to um, ask you if you would consider recommending then an oil application later in the season to clean up some of that mildew that could overwinter then. Very or, good point. Or I another don't... eradicant. Well, I don't know of another. <laughs> it could be difficult that that's, that needs to be studied. The reason is that the cosmotesia is, is, is a, as a structure, as you know better than anyone else, is the, is the protective of the, of those ascospores. Oil base may not activate it. You need something to maybe activate it and then that could burst that one. But I'm not sure if oil will uh, control the cosmotesia. I have okay. no information about that. But uh, uh, in Europe, uh, there is a beneficial uh, the fungi uh, that they identified that they can colonize cosmotesia and then and then oh. kill the within the uh, the ascor supports within the cosmotesia. Um, so I have been collaborating with um, the, one of my colleagues from University of Florence from Italy, and uh, we are uh, planning to do such studies here uh, to 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 see if we can. Apparently, we should have the similar uh, the, the fungi in California vineyards. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, anyone has looked at it. That's like the natural occurring uh, fungi. So that kind of studies um, or would answer that kind of questions. I don't know if uh, Larry has any uh, experience uh, with that one. No, not, not with uh, dormant oil. Um... I mean, lime sulfur at dormant applications have an uh, impact on uh, Clysothecia, but they have to be put on at very high volumes. And so again, we did, we, we actually did studies years ago where we looked at dormant lime sulfur, and that was uh, like 10 gallons of lime sulfur per hundred and sprayed a couple hundred gallons of water to really soak the uh, bark of the vines. And then compare those to either oil at uh, one inch shoot growth or sulfur, wettable sulfur at one inch shoot growth. 
And then if you, we did those treatments and then did nothing until we saw a disease and they, they all are effective in reducing the initial infection points. But uh, so my, my take home message is lime sulfur is a very nasty material to use. And so I guess you'd have to ask yourself, is that worthwhile doing versus a, a very early season uh, oil application or a, uh, you know, a dry flowable sulfur application that will give you the same level of uh, suppression of those early infections. The problem with, with anything that affects Lyme uh, Clystothesia, they, 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 uh, there's a lot of, I mean, if you're in a high pressure area and get, have a lot of mildew late season on the leaves, you, I mean, we, I know a lot of these coastal, coastal vineyards, we know they have very high levels of uh, Clystothesia on the bark. Um, but they don't all, you know, release at the same time. They release depending on how, how they matured. And so, you know, it, it's really hard to get all of them. And I mean, they're hidden in the bark and so it's hard to get contact. And so sometimes I think you're better off putting your, if you know you think you have high levels of disease of previous season, you put a lot of effort into maybe doing some early season treatments. And I think it'll get you the same level of control as worrying about, uh, you know, doing dormant or late season applications after the fruit's already been, uh, uh, you know, is already safe from a new infection. Yeah, I recall Doug always used to like to ad advise oil early yeah. if you've had previous powdery right. mildew, yeah. but you know, he was never, I, I never got the specifics on, on that, you know, what, did he mean? right at, at bud break or, you know, was he, did he mean to sell like when you have a hundred percent bud break, you know, the shoots could be one to two inches. And uh, essentially what's happened is, and those are done at uh, high volume. So you're really wetting the cordons or the, the head of the vine mm -hmm. and all the spurs and that, that moisture then in, initiates ascospore release and that as those ascospores land in a film of oil or maybe they land in a film of uh, uh wettable sulfur that's on the plants and they you know they they they're taken care of so it eliminates so those infection periods i just want to emphasize with the 100 percent dormant uh part of the grapevine for the uh, lime sulfur application is that the you all know that uh, nowadays uh, we are not having harsh winter uh, that would allow our uh, grapevine and vineyards uh, get into the 100% dormant. Uh, we have experienced this one with uh, Lynn would know better than anyone else uh, this year. So in that case, um, if you are planning or thinking applying uh, lime sulfur, uh, when you apply application time or the 100% uh, dormant uh, level is very, very important. If you apply the lime sulfur when the wine is not 100% dormant, you could cause some, some damage as well as um, uh, Larry mentioned that. It's very, very important. Very good points. Thank you. Um, any, val any validity to the rumors of widespread Quintech resistance? I don't think it's widespread. We have a confirm in the East Coast. Uh, we have seen some reduction in efficacy here in California. I think a lot of table grape growers are moving it out of their programs because it's not as uh, efficient as it used to be. Uh, the isolates that we have a study that are resistant seems to be like a fitness cost. So reproduction is, is lower than, than the wild type. But we need to continue looking for it. Uh, the frame people are looking for primers to to uh, to evaluate the how widespread is the the resistance. But it's happening. But it's not a total failure. Thank you. I think it just encourages the need to be sure that we're always rotating our frat groups, right? That's correct. Um. So Larry, I think you kind of responded to this before in the chat box possibly, but um, did, so the, the thought of takeoff bloom, you were with the oil, um, you were talking about more to the fruit, right? The bloom of the right. fruit. So oil sprays will take, or, or they'll uh, have an effect on the wax that's on the surface of a berry. And so if you do applications post set, 
and especially very late when the berries are pretty good size, you will see kind of that bloom being taken off. And so obviously for table grapes, that's a big problem. For wine grapes, it's more of a cosmetic thing. Oils actually will suppress other diseases too. And so you can do oil applications, you'll see suppression in botrytis activity. So you always have to gauge what's important to you. If, you, if that's something that you think is an issue, then don't do it. I, I see mostly the, the oils being used early in the season prior to bloom or as cleanup sprays if you get yourself in a situation where you have a lot of active infections and you're trying to suppress those. So most people would rather have a little bit of spotting on the berries versus a little bit of mildew. So, you know, you just have to be careful how you use those products. Thank you. The next question is what's the best time or temperature to spray in general? I'm gonna say check the label, but if anyone has more to say to that, feel free. Depending on the weather conditions, calm, calm, and certainly as cool as it can be, um, depending on the, the season conditions. It's certainly not windy. And checking for inversions as well. Um, so not too calm. Not too calm. But um, Carrie, you know, I, I, I see something in the chat here from Edgar Godoy, and I'm wondering if uh, we can get some discussion about this, and it has to do with potassium bicarbonate. And um, and I'm just curious about Akif and others' take on whether um, on whether they've seen good eradicant activity with potassium bi bicarbonate. I recall Doug's uh, trials used to be um, mixed results um, with that, and so there was a reluctance, as I recall. To put to state that as a as a, an eradicant in our um, pest management guidelines, um, and there there seems to be some pushback on that in our chat here, saying that it's a that and I and I know that some growers like this material, so I'm gonna I'm gonna face up to something that's that's there. Do we have? Do we have data, Akif, on potassium bicarbonate that you'd stand behind? This year, this year uh, we applied uh, not exactly potassium carbonate, um, but bicarbonate, but close related to the a product that um, we cannot reveal it right now to test it, to see if we can have the curative effect of it. Uh, we haven't evaluated the, our trial yet. Uh, the next week, we are going to complete our evaluation, and then uh, that could be um, um, put in the, our lab website. I can tell you by just looking at the, the results yesterday, we had the good results that it looks like it killed the mildew. But what we did in this trial is that the, we let the mildew grow and then colonize on the berries to see how much of it is going to control. When you look at the berries, you see the mildew is dead, but berry is not useful because this, the, the, the damage has been done. But in this case, we were mostly focused on the, if we are going to kill the mildew rather than how the, the side effect is going to be. Um, we just started looking at it, and, and I don't have the results for it yet, um, but... Um, Soon we are going to come up with, with that. So some of the products also I included uh, in this trial uh, also uh, closely related uh, these uh, group of the fungicide. Um, those are also showing some efficacy. And when I look at the Doug Gubler's um, uh, results, some year it showed, some year it didn't show, but we have been getting some uh, the, the consistent, consistent uh, results. Um, again, so these kinds of chemicals, it depends on the level of the pressure, location, all kinds of things. It's gonna perform differently. Uh, I have to put it in this way. Sometimes chemical itself could be a gold controller if you don't have the good efficacy. It could uh, the, the 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 way of putting in the on the grapevine, it may not work or it may work. So anyway. So the, the short answer for the question, I don't have the answer yet. <laughs> so we are working on that. 
but you're you're you tested something other than the registered i think it's cali green yes the pro yes. the product okay yes. so with a similar active yes okay thank you akif i just yeah i hope thank that you. helps edgar thank you for pointing that out so reviewing your field trials oxidate and pure spray appear to be effective newer organic products do you agree, do you agree and are there other organic products beneficial to add in uh, the tank mix? Well, for the tanks, tank mix, you have to go with the label, uh, not uh, what we are recommending you, uh, what you need to do. Uh, so we, we apply some of those different, um, the, the oil-based products, they work very well. When, you, when we apply them in the late season, some of them show uh, some um, the, the toxicity, as I mentioned you that. So those are the good options, but uh, I don't have anything in my mind that could be added in that mix. When you look at the, our last two, three years of the results, you will see some other organically acceptable biocontrol agents um, are, are working very well if you like to choose or alternate with them. So those are available as well. All right, thank you. Um, so I think we just have one more question. Uh, are there considerations for spraying during bloom, especially with respect respect to fertility and or fruit set? I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I don't think that there's a danger in uh, affecting fruit set with a a, a a properly tank mixed, following the label mildew spray. What about the rest of you? I agree. Yes. So you shouldn't think, be afraid to spray during bloom time. Yeah. Yes, I think what you need to do is spray because you have the two problems there is a perfect stage for other mildew infection and also for botrytis. So if you skip that spray, you're going to be in problems. But at the end, you have to follow the label. Sure. Yes. And label have good agitation law. and everything else. Yes. Valid point. I... Wow, I think this was a really great meeting. I think everyone deserves a round of applause. Uh, the attendees for coming, we had about 200 people at one point in time and for our excellent present, uh, presentations and presenters today, and also just for the, the really great uh, collaboration on this meeting. I think, I think it was great.